so as we, as we jump in tonight and we uh, begin, I'd love to invite you to start with me uh, a prayer. And it's a pretty simple prayer. You don't even have to know the words. Uh, it is on the sheet if you want to take a look at it later. But there'll be a point in the prayer where it says the word silence. And after that phrase, uh, just so it doesn't like freak you out or you're like, what is going on? Uh, I am going to pause for just a moment. And we're just going to kind of sit in that space and then we'll keep going. Sound good to everybody? So we're going to jump into this tonight. So Holy One, untamed by the names I give you, in the silence of this moment, name me. And we'll pause. <clears throat> name us. That I may know who I am, hear the truth you have put into me, trust the love you have for me, which you call me to live out with my sisters and brothers in your human family. Amen. Amen. Hey, again, it is good to be with you tonight. Again, my name is Justin, if we're meeting for the first time. And we are continuing down a path that the last few weeks have kind of uh, led us on as well, centering on a text or a phrase that Jesus says that is so good. And uh, I bet some of you can even help me out with this. It goes, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but my purpose is to give a rich and satisfying life. There it is. Yes. So we're going to kind of let that serve as a backdrop and a foundation for everything else we're going to talk about tonight. But if you're just catching up or jumping in for the first time, we've been letting those words of Jesus, that deep promise that we're invited to a life of purpose, a life of flourishing, a life that's rich, a life that's satisfying. We've been looking at how there are some other ways that seek to work against that, some ways that seek to steal that, kill that, to destroy that. And particularly tonight, I want to invite us to pay attention to a way that I think is so insidious that can work so heavily against that flourishing life. And it's this thing known as cynicism. And so we're going to spend some time with that. But as we get into it, I, I want to share a couple of things that it made me think of and ask for your help on naming something. So real quick, do you all know, like in your car or your truck, there's that handle right up here that you grab in moments of distress? I just need to know, like, what do you call it? Because I know what I call it. But I don't know if I can say that, or you can say that, or who can say that. You with me? Like that handle, but we're all on the same page? That, oh, something, something handle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I was thinking about that. I was thinking about cynicism, and, and we'll get back into that in a moment. But um, it took me back. There's something for me about fall. Uh, I find myself wanting to explore more trails. It, something about the weather, the change of the light, the feel of the air, it just draws me to keep exploring past the hot or warmer days of summer. And so even some of the work I'm doing right now has me in a new context where every week I'm picking a road I've never been down and I'm wandering. Anybody like that? You like to wander? You like to explore? Um, and as I've been doing that and even thinking about what we're talking about tonight, it took me back to being a kid. I grew up right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, my brother's nine years older than me and was always tinkering with this truck that he was fixing up. And I remember like it was a really cool moment because regularly as he would get it running or make some type of modification, we would jump in the truck and we would totally hit whatever off-road place we could find as soon as possible. And I really became adept at using the handle, the oh something something handle. I was good at it because if I didn't use it, I would not be here chatting with you. My brother was insane. Matter of fact, I remember there were times my sister and I would be in the truck with him and he would stop after something went crazy wrong, but somehow we still survived. And he'd say, make sure you don't tell the parents. And so like, it took me back to using the handle. Um, earlier uh, this year, I got to go on a trip with some friends and we found ourselves in the Midwest and uh, my friend Preston was driving us and it was a rainstorm and it was foggy and he was really enthralled in our conversation and I'm glad he likes me. But I kept feeling uneasy because again, did I say it was fog and it was rainy? And he was going like 95 and pushing it even higher than that. And so imagine you can't see anything in front of you. It's fog, it's rain, the conditions are not optimal for moving that fast in a vehicle together. And sure enough, right out of the fog, I see the emergence of the taillights 
of a big semi-truck and trailer. And so again, that old school practice from my childhood came back and helped me feel safe as I used the handle. And so I was thinking about that, but then I was thinking about moments where I didn't get to use the handle. And I hope you won't judge me, but there was a former part of my life where somehow I found myself a few times being escorted or driven around a courtesy of the city of Memphis uh, in the back seat of a public service car. And, and they did this thing. It was interesting when they would put me in that car. Um, they, they did something with my hands. Um, and so, so I wasn't able to access the handle. And I remember the feeling when they would drive and take the corners fast of moving along that little slick seat back and forth. It was almost like this rhythmic metronome kind of experience and I couldn't grab the handle. And um, for a lot of reasons, that moment was a little bit uh, disruptive in my life and concerning and I will assure you, I haven't been back in those cars in a little bit, so we're okay. <laughs> um, but the contrast between the two in one, even though everything around me was shifting and shaking and I wasn't sure what the driver was gonna do, there was something about having something to grab onto that felt for the moment like a stabilizing presence. But in those other moments where I couldn't grab, I just felt like I was at the whim of something other than myself. And that is kind of um, a really vulnerable place to be. Well, we know that's what life feels like a lot of times too. There are moments that are deeply vulnerable where things seem chaotic and out of control and it's normal. It's actually our human impulse, our God-given impulse to desire security, to desire stability. And I think therefore our, our notion that we would try to grab onto something and hold on is good. The challenge is the handle's a great momentary stabilizer. But one of the things you do when you grab the handle is you clench the fist, right? and you're, you're tight and kind of um, everything is pulled in, it's good for the moment, but it doesn't make for a great way to live. Because if you think about life with closed fists and clenched, um, it kind of pulls us back from being able to experience goodness with people, goodness with God, goodness with ourself, goodness in the world. So I wanted to use that metaphorically, that it's natural that we would try to grab something and hold on but it's not a way to live our life closed-fisted. There's something about being open-handed. There's something about embracing the bigger moment. And why I say all that is because if we're thinking about this thing known as cynicism, I actually think it is a clutching attempt to deal with the pain, the uncertainty, the fear, and the stuff in life that just gets heavy. Like some of you here tonight might know what it feels like to be disappointed. You gave your life to something good, and it didn't work out the way you thought it was gonna work out. I bet some of you here, if we could share our stories, you have given yourself in love and in compassion to another person or group of people, and it has been a painful journey for you. That is the reality of the world, right? And I think compassion fatigue and things again like fear, disappointment, discouragement, I think all of those things can lead to cynicism, which if you look it up, just is defined as this distrustful kind of posture, this pessimistic posture, this gripping to hold on to something and therefore defining things in a smaller way because we think we can control them and they'll feel more secure. But the challenge is a moment of maybe holding on to something is good, but a life that gets built on pessimism and cynicism and that way of viewing the world and other people, it shrinks us, it paralyzes us, and it keeps us from living into, again, what Jesus said, that rich and satisfying life. And so I was thinking about this and, and kind of throughout the scriptures and even you know, in our own world, I think there are some voices that speak to this. Um, there's a collection of wisdom literature in the Old Testament of the Bible, one text in particular, uh, Ecclesiastes, where this wisdom teacher, this uh, person who had experienced some life, they were paying attention. As they surveyed their life, they said, everything is wearisome beyond description. And some of you may feel that way. We live in a moment, we live in a chunk of time that I think many people would say has been heavy and felt wearisome. And in those kinds of moments, we can be tempted towards cynicism. We can be tempted to that gripping, smaller, clutching life. Um, 
But in John, what I love is that Jesus not only says, I want to give you the rich and satisfying life, he's talking to people who are fatigued and who know that temptation. If you read more of the John 10 story, he's using an analogy that he's the good shepherd and he gives himself up for those he loves, his people, his sheep. And he's even speaking to those in that crowd and he's speaking to us today. Some of you know the pain of people being hucksters and not trustworthy. Some of you know what it's like for people to do you wrong, for situations to do you wrong, for groups of people or institutions to do you wrong. Jesus doesn't shrink back from that. And he calls those ways of being that are doing people wrong and maybe have done some of us wrong, he calls them thieves. He calls them, again, hirelings. He calls them something less than what should have been. But he still invites us into his way, his way that is purposeful and rich and satisfying. And um, here's a few other voices that I think speak to, though, what cynicism can do. But again, Jesus wants to give us an alternative. So Stephen Colbert, obviously a wisdom voice of our day. Yes, um, I, I thought this was really pointed. Uh, Colbert says that cynicism masquerades as wisdom, but it's the farthest thing from it because cynics don't learn anything. Cynicism, he says, is a self-imposed blindness, a rejection of the world because we are afraid it will hurt us or disappoint us. And so we close our fists. Bell Hooks, uh, I've really appreciated her voice for some time. She says cynicism is the greatest barrier to love. It's rooted in doubt, it's rooted in despair, it in in fear intensifies our doubt, it paralyzes. Faith and hope, she says, allow us to let go, but fear stands in the way of love. And then Maya Angelou said that, and this one got me, because notice in this one she's talking about youthful cynicism. And it's sad to observe, she says, because it indicates not so much knowledge learned from a bitter experience as insufficient trust even to attempt the future. And, and that one got me because I'm the dad of four kids. And when she's speaking to this issue, again, of youthful cynicism, I'm comfortable having real conversations that we live in a moment and in a world that can be painful and heavy and hard. But there's something about that cynicism way that seems to be pervasive that I sure know I don't want for my kids, and she nails it. Because cynicism, I think, gets in the way of a better future. And the voice of wisdom from the Proverbs, a part of scripture we find in the Old Testament, says it so well. That kind of cynic way, it actually can ruin our ability to be hopeful people who help heal the world. Here's how the text says it. A gain of cynics can upset a whole city, but a group of sages can calm everyone down. And who's with me like, it would be good to have some folks calming everyone down right now. And so tonight, fellow sages, that's what we're invited to be people of wisdom, people like Jesus, people invited into purpose and a rich and satisfying life. What I wanted to do is share a practice that I've found helpful, that Jesus followers throughout a lot of periods of time have found helpful when we deal with hard moments that could tempt us to become cynics. And instead of gripping and closing our fists and shrinking back, it could lead us to an open and a full and a flourishing life. It's a practice known as lament. And we'll get to it in just a second, how it works. But I was thinking about this and how we respond to the hardships of life. And again, I thought of Jesus. In uh, John chapter 16, verse 33, he says, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I hope you've heard that today, before, but if you haven't, I hope right now you hear Jesus honestly saying, this world has its moments, its difficulties, its heaviness, but take heart. That's the call to action. And I would say what we're talking about tonight in dealing with cynicism is a response to take heart, to not become cynics. And so this practice of lament really is how to take heart. It's how to lean into that way. So a couple of little things before we kind of get into the practice itself. Um, a chunk of scripture I've found really helpful in living into this is a collection of uh, songs and poems and prayers known as the Psalms. So in just a few minutes, we're going to sing our prayers to God. We're going to come around and sing poems and prayers and songs. It's exactly what the Psalms are. And I don't know if you know this, but the majority, some would say well over 70% of the Psalms are lament. They are either directly a lament for an individual a lament for a community of people, 
or they're a psalm that deals with lament. And that's interesting because rightfully so, we speak of the way of Jesus, the life that God has brought us into is good news. So why would therefore the scriptures give so much attention to lament? Maybe it's because what we're talking about, that the ability to lament instead of becoming cynics leads us into a good news life for the sake of us and the world. And so tonight, I want to use the Psalms as a little bit of a, um, a paradigm, a model for how this practice works and invite us to create our own laments. Maybe tonight, it might be tomorrow or whenever we face those moments where we want to grab the handle of life and try to hold on. And um, one thing I'll say, I think that gets at this, and I think it's a beautiful statement. Uh, there's a theologian I appreciate, Soong Chan Ra, who said that the language of lament is the language of humility. And I think if you want to talk about the counter to becoming cynics, it's the humble way. It's the Jesus way. It's the way that leads to the rich and satisfying life. So how to create our own lament. I'm just going to walk you through this a little bit. And uh, you can feel free to write on the paper. You can feel to just listen and kind of work this out in your own space or time. You might have something right now that is heavy, that is painful, that you're walking through where you feel that pull to become cynical, to close yourself off, and maybe you want to even kind of walk through this practice in real time. One note as we jump in, I would encourage uh, you, and I didn't come up with this, someone really helped me with this, as much as I use my phone for notes and, and I enjoy it, I would encourage you as much as you're uh, able to like write with your actual hand on something tactile like paper. Um, and the reason is I, I came across the work, Krista Tippett, um, she hosts a great podcast I enjoy called On Being, and she was interviewing Dr. Christine Runyon, who's a clinical psychiatrist and also a professor, and just talking about how when we write by hand, as distinct from typing, that we are processing emotionally as well as mentally. So there's something to that. So let's walk into how to craft a lament. So first, we are invited to cry out to God. So instead of just grabbing the handle and pretending all is well, we are invited to address God. So the first thing in the crafting of lament is how do you need to or want to address God? So the Psalms are full of this language. In Psalm 13, we hear this refrain, How long, O Lord? And I bet there's some of you here who have walked through things, are walking through things, or will walk through things, and that'll be the feeling in your gut. And I want to tell you the good news of the God who's fully shown up in Jesus as he invites you to speak to him out of relationship and honestly. So you can say things like, How long, O Lord? you can start that address by crying out to God. There's another example of this in Psalm 28. Don't turn a deaf ear to me. Like, look at me, listen to me, see me. So the first thing we do is we get to address God in real terms. And I don't know about you, but isn't it good that we have a creator, the mysterious Holy One of the ages, who's come to us in Jesus, who invites us to talk to him that way. The Psalms are full of this language. So if you're like, can we really? You can. We address God. We cry out to God. Once we do that, we voice the complaint. We voice our pain. We name the thing. So what anger, what pain, what heartache, what sadness do we need to discuss with God? And we get to put it on the table. Psalm 22, this is a famous one, at least for some who are familiar with the story of Jesus. Because Psalm 22 has these words, why have you abandoned me? Or maybe some of you have heard it, why have you forsaken me? We see Jesus quoting, reading those words from the cross. Father, why have you forsaken me? He is lamenting. He is voicing this distance, this complaint, this pain, this heartache, this sadness. There's another place in Psalm 6 where it says, I am just worn out because of all of these things coming against me. We are invited to voice the complaint, the hurt, the pain. I think it's important to notice that that is so important because if we ignore it, stuff it, try to pretend it's not there, it will eat us up. And we do become cynical in the process. After that, we are invited, and I think the wisdom of the psalm paradigm, to then affirm our trust. So think about it. We talk honestly to God. We tell him what's going on. And it's not like we're doing a magic show here to get God to do what we want. But because God can be trusted with our real stuff, with our real conversation, with our real lives, 
it also would make sense that we would affirm trust the God who's been with us all along. And maybe tonight that's a brand new concept for you, and you're like, I just walked in here and I don't really know how this all works. You could start with this. God woke us up today, infused breath in our lungs, put us in a room with some other people. We are not alone. Like there are ways God is regularly showing up in our life. And this notion of affirming trust is where we look back on our life to a moment when we've experienced God's love and care and we name it. Psalm 13, there's an example of this. Again, that honest conversation with God also includes, though, but even in the midst of my complaint, God, I trust you because you rescued me. I could tell you story after story after story of how God has rescued me, has freed me, has been gracious to me. I can name particulars. You know, I named the moments in the back seat of the car at the service of the city of Memphis. There were reasons that happened. And God has accepted me, forgiven me, and given me a life that is flourishing beyond degree. And I get to name that, and you get to name that. So we cry out, we voice our complaint, we affirm our trust, and then we just say what we want, what we need, our request. So this is the question, what's your deepest desire? What is it you need God to come through for for you? What do you want for your life in this moment? I love how Psalm 13 gives us an example of how honestly we can do that. There's a part in there that says, turn and answer me, God. And then this line, restore the sparkle to my eyes. I mean, some of us, that probably strikes a chord. Yeah, restore that sense of flourishing and life and vibrancy, God. Come on, I need it. I can't live without it. And I don't know where I'm going to get it if you don't provide it. So we share our request. And then this is an act of faith. We then rest in assurance. What I mean is how can we acknowledge that God is actually listening to us? And we don't make this up. We know this because of our history. We know this because of God's faithfulness. And the Psalms show us this pattern. Psalm 28, the writer of that Psalm does this by saying, the Lord has heard my cry for mercy. It could be just a statement. I've spoken to you honestly. I've made my complaint. I've done all this stuff. And now, God, you've heard me. And I'm good with that. It could be simple language. And then I love the response, the last part. And it's this, how will we respond to God with gratitude because of this moment, this honest conversation, this ability to lament instead of becoming bitter, this ability to lean into the rich and satisfying life of Jesus? How are we going to respond? I think often there is something to give gratitude for. And the other thing that helps me a lot is to think of a metaphor that describes God's presence in that moment. So I'll give you an example. Uh, psalm 94, in this lament process, the author of that psalm sees God as a mighty rock. One of the places I love to visit is uh, Pacific City, Oregon. Have any of you ever been to Pacific City? Uh, you've probably seen something similar at Cannon Beach or elsewhere, those magnificent rocks that just kind of stand and they're just picturesque and we all take bad pictures on our iPhones of them and share them because even though we know it doesn't do it they are just we can't just not right but there's something about those rocks that they capture us they don't go anywhere they're strong they're sustained winds waves it doesn't matter and yet the creator is even more so of that kind of stabilizing always consistent presence and so maybe in a lament you would write out these phrases these things but maybe on this last one, you would stretch your uh, kind of even action in this. I, I'm not a good uh, artist, actually. I won't let you see it. But sometimes I'll sketch out the thing that I see God as. There's something about responding and giving thanks, but there's something also about thinking of the image that represents God's way of being with us in these moments that we can then meditate on, like God is a mighty rock. So here's the invitation. In a world that is heavy sometimes, and can draw us towards cynicism, Jesus says, I have a better way, the rich and satisfying life. And I think lamenting versus ignoring, lamenting versus becoming bitter, lamenting versus becoming skeptical is the invitation. Jesus did it, and he invites us to do it, and it leads us into freedom. And so I hope that's helpful. I hope that's a practice we can take and run with and just see how God would form our lives through it and then send us to be agents of healing in the world. So again, you know the statement, the words of Jesus. Let's say them all together again from John 10, 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, to destroy. But my purpose 
is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus, tonight and in every night and in every morning and in every moment, you are pouring out kindness upon kindness. And I would pray for those of us who are walking through maybe the heavier side of things right now and the notion of pain and the notion of being drawn into something that feels closed off in a tight grip and not open-handed. Yeah, it's been hard. I pray tonight like a fresh wind you would blow through our lives. I pray tonight you would awaken us, invite us to give ourselves over to you in honest conversation, lament, instead of withdrawing and becoming paralyzed. We are ready now, Lord, to sing our songs, our prayers, our modern moment psalms to you. So we open our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our imaginations Lead us into the rich and satisfying life, and thank you for it. There is no shadow that could ever overcome your light. There is no rival that can ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you, and there is no army with the power to conquer truth. Disappointment and break every chain. Oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name.
back.